please review them before we get to the questions and answers. And for a reminder, only Tiger Bay members can ask questions, except of course for Peter. And you can only ask one question, uh, no speeches, and no follow-up. Oh, uh, Peter will take care of the follow-up. I think you all know Peter Shorsch, and without further ado, I'll just let him introduce himself <laughs> for a bit. Thank you. Good afternoon, Tigers. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, I'm going to skip the intro as well because I think we have uh, we have a lot of questions uh, for a a Pinellas delegation which has a lot of experience. Uh, if you look at um, the seven people up here, um, there is a lot of experience. There's a, there's people that are being termed out, termed out like Representative Rusan. And then, of course, there's Chris Ladvala, whose crowning achievement this year was to not be recognized as a House page. So it is a. <laughs> I grew a beard. <laughs> so we, the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask questions for the first part. Then I'm going to turn it over to you all for a few questions, which I will be moderating. I'm going to be doing Chuck Todd style. I reserve the right to um, to interrupt, to uh, ask follow-ups where needed. I ask that you limit your questions to two legislators. We're not going to have four questions asked today and have the whole panel ask uh, answer them. Um, I, I think we'd like to get as many answers as possible to the questions. And then for the last five minutes, we're going to do everyone's favorite, which is a rapid fire kind of uh, 10 words or less answers to get some, um, some uh, fun answers to some fun questions. So. Um, I'm going to start off. Uh, I asked on Facebook um, <clears throat> for suggestions for questions, and one person, her name is Kathleen Peters of South Pasadena, replied, <laughs> and this is to everyone, what do you think uh, was the most important piece of legislation to impact Floridians that passed and why? You have 90 seconds. I'm going to start with Representative Ahern. Thank you. Testing. Here we go. Uh, most important piece of legislation, well, I'll, I'll just uh, point it too quickly just in case I, I don't get another chance since I have 90 seconds. Uh, one was the uh, auditory oral education, uh, which uh, uh, helps to fund uh, deaf children who have the cochlear implants. Uh, couldn't get the bill through uh, to give them more points to pay for it. It's about five times more expensive educate a child with cochlear implants, but it changes their life. And we were able to get the funding, about $700,000, so that they could do matching grants to be able to provide for the children of Florida who have these cochlear implants that would now get mainstream uh, into the, uh, the school system because they can hear and need to be taught to speak and after they can hear. And then the, on the other side of that was a guardianship bill, a very important piece of legislation uh, that helps protect uh, our elderly from those who, through court-appointed guardianships, uh, sometimes take advantage of the situation that they were placed in and are not caring for the uh, person they were charged to protect properly. So put some uh, regulatory uh, status in there. Thank you. Senator Brandis. Right here. Uh, so if you look at some of our legislation this year, we have, we have a constitutional amendment on the primary ballot that deals with solar energy. One of the things I've heard from many of you is that Ford needs to do more for solar. And so this will give you an opportunity to create a more tax exemption for solar panels on, on all the property for 20 years. Chairman Lab Ballot a number of years ago passed a, a, a solar energy exemption for residential properties. But for the bulk of us, uh, the best benefit for solar that we're going to get is to scale that and to allow a larger properties to have that exemption as well. So I think that's a good Representative Dudley? Thank, thank you. Happy to be here. Um, I think early learning funding is probably the most seismic, crucial, most important thing. I was happy to be co-sponsoring a, a bill with uh, Representative Lat Allen to create quality early learning. Unfortunately, it did not move. We're hopeful uh, that maybe next round, uh, next time, we'll, we'll be better. But uh, there are so many benefits to early learning. Have the five uh, failure factories, we might turn them into the future factories uh, here in St. Pete. Uh, early learning is crucial. 701 ROI, even my uh, Florida Tax Watch 
So there's so much more that we can do with early learning to greatly transform uh, our communities to reduce our prison population, to bring business and industry to our communities, to our state. Uh, that's what we need to do much more. Thank you. Representative Latvella. Thank you very much. Uh, I was honored to uh, sponsor and pass, and it was signed by the governor a couple weeks ago, a juvenile expungement bill uh, that garnered support from 29 of my colleagues in the House from both sides of the aisle, uh, who the, the minority leader of the House uh, stated that it was one of the uh, sleeper bills of the session that would have a lasting impact on uh, students and kids throughout Florida. Uh, and it garnered support from groups such as the Southern Law Poverty Law Center um, to the other side of the aisle, the James Madison Institute and groups in between. Um, and what my bill would have uh, did is it brought down the age of an automatic expungement to the age of 21 from the age of 24 for a uh, um, somebody who is not a, a serious or habitual offender. Uh, violent offender and it also had a provision in there if they were between the ages of 18 and 21 and had not been rearrested in the previous five years that they could apply for early um, expungement uh, so that was uh, the bill that I was most proud of this year and I think that it'll have a lasting impact on a lot of uh, kids and, and young adults in Florida thank you Senator Latvala Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon. Um, as I understood the question, the question was the two was was the major pieces of legislation that passed. What was the major? Just to rephrase, um, what was the most important piece of legislation that will impact Floridians that passed, and why? Right. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna flip the big picture. Two issues uh, that passed. One was the Legacy Florida Bill, which is uh, setting aside two hundred million dollars a year. Uh, for the next 20 years will be spent on the Everglades and the uh, water flow in South Florida. We've got a really disastrous situation uh, going on with uh, Lake Okeechobee right now and uh, flooding out some of that dirty water to the estuary and the other side of the state. Uh, it will also put some money into springs, $50 million a year. Uh, both of which I think are, are very worthwhile. Those are the natural treasures of our state that need to be protected. Uh, the most important piece of legislation that's passed every year, the only thing that the legislature is required to do by the Constitution is the budget. And this year's uh, budget was an $82 million budget. And uh, we, we did real well for Pinellas County in that budget. Uh, there's a, a $10 million uh, student success building uh, to replace a, an old and, and much need of improvement uh, building at St. Pete College. Uh, resources for Ruth Eckert Hall, for the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, for the Clearwater Free Clinic, for the Warehouse Art District here in St. Petersburg, and, and a long list of worthwhile projects. Thank you, Senator. Representative Kathleen Peters. Um, thanks, Peter, and thanks for taking my question. Um, what I think was the most important legislation, and I believe it is the core problem within every sector of government, and that is the lack of mental health services and coordinated care that we have. And because mental health still has a stigma, it's just never talked about, it's never addressed. But if you look at the core problems within healthcare, if someone has a mental illness and diabetes, they're not taking care of their diabetes if they're not taking care of their mental health. And when they do go into the ER, the costs are exorbitant, and they are truly costing us a lot of money. It is the court choke in our jails. It is the court choke in our court systems. It is the reason, number one reason, children are taken away from their families is mental health and substance abuse. And so that is at the core of every crisis that we have and consuming every budget um, depart, depart the budgets within each department. So, so this year we've passed nine bills related to mental health and substance abuse. And it is the most comprehensive change within mental health and substance abuse that I think Florida's ever seen since 1970. Um, and it truly will create a coordinated care of service, access through any door. Some things you'll see immediately right away change so that there'll be access for people who need help. Um, some of it, the infrastructure is going to take a little while, but I promise you within five years we will have a good, comprehensive system with quality access of care, and I think that is the number one um, most important legislation that we passed this year. And Representative Daryl Roussan. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, I think Senator Lockwell hit it on the head. Uh, our single constitutional duty is to pass the budget. But I think in a particular area of the budget, very significantly, the governor's office wanted to increase spending on education by increasing the required local level property taxes. But we resisted that and we bought down $400 million in property tax relief. Now that's, that's real relief to working people. And I think that was one of the most significant pieces of legislation to come out of the budget. Uh, secondly, in a, in a selfish kind of way, um, I think my bill, the backyard gun range bill, was significant. And I'm sure that there are a few neighbors in Lakewood Estates that would agree with that. <laughs> Representative, will you keep the microphone? This is a 60 second, sort of a follow up to that. Tia Mitchell, the uh, Times Bureau Chief, uh, Times Union Bureau Chief, uh, had a story at the early part of the season that said that there was a, quote, unholy alliance between the Legislative Black Caucus and the Republican House leadership. I'll give you 60 seconds to respond to that article. Um, was there an, an alliance, unofficial or not? Well, I don't Republican speak, leaderships? I don't speak for the Black Caucus. I'm not the chair. Uh, what I will say is if you're smart in your politics as a legislator in Tallahassee, you learn to build alliances and collaborations with those who hold the purse and hold the power. All right, hang on to that microphone. This is for Representative Dudley and Representative Roussan. Fill in the blank here. Florida House Democrats will have 50 members in the legislature when? Right now, currently, there are, uh, there are 41 41 members of the Florida House, 39, excuse me, uh, 39 Democrats in the Florida House. There are um, 71 Republicans. So when when will House Democrats get to 50? Shortly after we pass an independent redistricting uh, commission bill that will give ungerrymandered districts uh, to the citizens of the state of Florida so uh, we can have uh, more fair, more representative, Representation Senator Lafalla, did you have a? Did you want to interject there? Um, I think the words were "hell freezes over." Um, <coughs> Representative Rusan, how would you respond to that question? Well, hell is frozen. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that It's going to be difficult in the next couple of cycles to get to that number, but realistically, if Democrats turn out and vote and like the Republicans do in the grassroots level, we can get there fairly quickly. Okay, this is a, a 60 second, and this is going to go to the Republican members, Ahern Brandis, Ladvala, Ladvala Peters. Uh, if you could give one piece of advice to Governor Scott on how to better improve relationship with the legislature, what would that be? <laughs> I'm just winning my own fang and claw here. I would say engage with us a little bit sooner uh, than later when it comes to uh, drafting budgets and, and so forth. Uh, uh, it always helps. And we're always told, let's interact with the uh, uh, principals or the, the, the folks that, let's say it's a, an education bill. We should talk with the teachers first and, and the principals and the superintendents. I think it's a, it could work the same way a little bit more uh, with the legislature as well, interaction. So I agree. It, it, there's, uh, their office is not been known for their legislative affairs division. In fact, at one point in session, I, I, I questioned their legislative affairs director if there was land blood on my door because they kept passing over it. <laughs> So one of my one of the things I've encouraged them to do is to come sit with members more. You know, it's, it's amazing that they can't find their way to the third floor of the fourth floor of the Senate office building at least once a day to stick their head in and ask how they can help us be successful. Representative Blackfellow, I would say uh, not to take things personal and to go easy with the veto pen. <laughs> Senator Latvella. I think all of us, uh, whether we're in the legislature or in the governor's office, need to respect the priorities and positions of each other. Uh, we, we have a lot of emphasis on uh, the priorities of the legislative leaders and passing those the first couple of days and so forth. I've always thought that the most successful elected officials and the most successful leaders are those that make sure all of the members of their body are successful and get their priorities done. 
Representative Peters. There's not much more to say after all that. I think everyone covered it very much, but um, where I found success with the staff is when um, we work closely with the secretaries. Um, I think Senator Levell and Senator Brandis have had great success when they work with DOT and the secretaries and their staff. I've had great success working with DCF, um, particularly with mental health. Um, and I have a very good relationship with the governor's um, deputy chief of staff. And, and so we meet regularly and socially. So, so I think it's, it's all about relationship building. It doesn't matter if it's business or politics, it's all about relationship building. This question's for Representative Ahern. Um, it seemed as if the Florida House spent a uh, maybe a disproportionate amount of time discussing social conservative issues, uh, issues that were not brought up in the House or in the Senate. And they also brought up several issues that were, quote, dead on arrival in the Senate, things uh, dealing with gun legislation, et cetera. Explain the House's thinking on that. What were, why did you all spend so much time on bills that seemed like they were dead and were not moving no matter what happened in the House? They passed by wide margins, but then when they got over to Chairman Diaz de la Portilla, et cetera, they seemed dead on arrival. Well, I think it, it has to do with the, uh, the makeup of the membership uh, with a much larger body. Uh, there's a lot more, I think, um, free flow of ideas and willingness to discuss the issues, whether they're, they're DOA or not. We, you know, we know that uh, the Senate uh, you know, holds several positions that the House doesn't. Uh, but I think it's important that what we think as, a, as you know, as, as the, I think, you know, closest to the people, our rep you know, our representation is, um, you know, that they're on a, on, on a, a social issue that uh, we, we, we talk about a lot in the House, um, that this, there is a compelling state interest in the lives of uh, the unborn, for, for instance, or in gun rights and Second Amendment rights. Uh, you know, and we like to have that lively discussion, and, and trust me, it's a it's a lively one that passes uh, uh, sometimes on very close votes or not. Thank you. This is for Representative Rusan and Senator Latvala. Uh, the 2016 legislative session began two months earlier than its usual springtime start. You two have the most experience in the legislature. Uh, do you support this calendar shakeup every two years? What were the advantages and disadvantages to starting in January as opposed to March? Well, I, I do support it. Uh, one of the advantages is giving agencies of state government the opportunity to plan and be prepared for July 1 when the fiscal year starts, as opposed to um, a later start when they when they have to be prepared for budget events. Senator Lapel? I know that's the official reason that we all talked about <laughs> when we voted on it, but I think the real reason is twofold. Number one, we have a lot of younger members they want to be uh, spend spring break with their kids, and I don't have any uh, problem with that. I think there's also a lot of members that wanted to get home and start the campaigns. Uh, when we voted on doing it again in two years, I was one of a handful of people that voted against it. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, and maybe partly because of the time we spent in Tallahassee last year, I just thought we were rushed in getting this year's program together. So. Uh, I think we've got two years. We ought to try to use the entire two years uh, to the benefit of what we're trying to accomplish up there. A follow-up to Senator Latvella. I get to ask this, and I will probably get popped later, but you are the appropriations, incoming appropriations chair. You're arguably one of the five most powerful people in Tallahassee, if not more so. But there has been some changes in some of the state Senate races that were factoring into the incoming Senate president's race. For example, Matt Gates, who was opposed to you, uh, is not going to be running, but George Gaynor, who had pledged to you, is is on a scale of 1 to 100. Give me a percentage after the elections in 2016 that you could become Senate president. Zero. Okay. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's one thing that's very important to me, and, uh, you know, I, I have a reputation of being kind of hard to live with in some respects. Uh, <laughs> But I also have a representation of someone who keeps the word, and I want to leave public office with that re re uh, reputation intact. Senator Brandis, one of the biggest issues was the uh, ride network, ride sharing services, Uber versus Lyft versus the taxi cabs. The biggest opponent to that was Senate President Andy Gardner. 
give us a prediction on what happens in 2017 with the Uber, Lyft, ride-sharing services debate. So I think regime change will bring a lot of opportunities. I think, well, as you saw uh, this year, our Senate president was was often quoted as saying, don't be afraid of the debate. But apparently, that didn't, that didn't count when it came to rideshare companies, because for days and days, that they'll set up the calendar and we failed to debate. Uh, I think the major concern was that we had the votes. We had the votes to pick up the House bill that was overwhelmingly supported by the Florida House, bipartisan support, and pass it off to the Senate floor. And, and the amazing thing is, um, of all of the issues that I know in transportation right now, I have never seen anything like uh, what the TNCs are doing for reducing the lives. And so I think on a variety of different reasons, for a variety of different reasons, we need to pick that bill up next year and pass it out. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Tigers. Um, keep an eye on the timer. Raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, please again try to direct your question to a individual legislator, two at most, um, and I again will reserve the right for follow-up. First question, Jim Jackson. Thank you. Uh, let me ask the question to people I can see over here. Um, my name is Jim Jackson. I'm on the board of directors of the League of Women Voters. I've got a lot of league people here today. You can thank us for fair districts or not. That took six years to get through, but that was certainly democracy. Um, and question. Question is to Senator Grandis and to uh, Representative Dudley. School choice has kind of been bastardized into um, not about parent choice, but about we got one pot of money uh, that we can divide that is now going to public schools, charter schools, some to private schools, some to tax credit scholarships. So the school choice... All right, let me just jump in here. This is not what's going to happen. Uh, this is my one chance to be moderator. Okay. Get up. I want you to begin your sentence with a word that begins with the letter W so that it ends with the question mark within 30 seconds. Please right. ask your question. Is that a question? No. Okay. What was your school choice? <laughs> yeah, that. What was the question? To Dwight Dudley and uh, Jeff Brandes, comments on school choice. Yeah. Absolutely. Parents want more choice. And Florida has the, one of the leading uh, uh, policies that allow them school choice. In fact, this year, we, we kind of broke the mold. We allowed students to take to go to a public school across county boundaries. And so whether it's private school, public school, charter school, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether it's playing sports, we allow for parents to have more choices to go to virtual school than almost any other state. I'm excited about where we are. When I talk to parents, they want the choice. They want the opportunity. To me, it's a it's a shining star of the Florida education system about how much choice we do offer parents. Representative Dudley? There's a place for charters. There are some good charter schools. Uh, the whole reason charters were begun with began, uh, they started was to create innovation. What we have today is a bunch of imitation. We have horrible, uh, a horrible lack of accountability with regard to our tax dollars. Seventy million dollars not accounted for. You have an example of Charters USA buying a building for three point seven five million, selling it six months later for nine million, nine point seven million. It is a scam. There's a ripoff to taxpayers, uh, equity, private equity groups, uh, and, and investors are very happy about treating education as an emerging market to the pain of taxpayers, not to the benefit of students. Complete lack of accountability, amazingly bad for taxpayers and bad for our children when we don't have accountability. Thank you. These kids don't get well educated and then have to come back. Thank you, Representative. Yeah. Next question, please. Yes, hi. My, my question is for Representative Wilson. Oh, uh, Wendy Newton. Um, what was the most rewarding um, thing about your eight years of service for the district? And um, what advice would you give someone that's looking to follow you? <laughs> The, the most rewarding for me has been to work and learn the budget process. 
and understand collaboration in order to get things done and be effective uh, for the district. There were several years when no Democrat in the House dared vote for the budget. And then in 2009, I became the lone Democrat in the House that voted for the budget. But that was because I learned how to be included and how to get things in the budget. Uh, this year, you've seen, we've seen a gradual shift since 2009 because of participation, inclusion, and getting things in it to where this year, even the Minority House leader and every Democrat in the House voted for the budget. Uh, also, it's, it's easy to serve during good times when the budget increases. I remember when it was 76 billion. This year it's 82 billion. Um, it's hard to serve during lean times and still pass legislation all right, you went over, now I get to follow up because you went over. So, tough question. Will, will Angela Rusan be on the ballot in 2016? You have to ask Angela. <laughs> Next question. I'm sorry, sir, I don't know your name. In the back, later. My name is Dick Averitt, South of the Village. I'm retired. My question for uh, both of my senators, and frankly, anybody else who cares to answer it. If you had an opportunity to vote on Florida changing the open primaries, why, why might you vote against it? Well, you're presuming that I would vote against it? Uh, as, as, you know, we, we haven't really had that opportunity. I believe that's a constitutional issue. Um, and therefore, it has to go in front of the people. Most of the, the election issues are. I uh, really haven't given it a lot of thought, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm a uh, supporter of the two-party system and um, have been all my life uh, in, here in Florida and, and I'm, I'm not seeing anything that's begging for a change. I think we've got a whole lot of issues uh, in Tallahassee that we deal with that are a whole lot uh, more begging for a change than that. Senator Brandis? I agree. <laughs> Next question. Hi, I'm Corey Adler. Uh, this is a question for um, Senator Latvala and Representative Latvala. Um, if, if Donald Trump is elected president, are you going to support him as your party leader? Well, you know, I always support the Republican nominee. I, I look forward to, to doing that on this occasion, but I will I will say that every day almost uh, something comes out of his mouth that disappoints me. And I, I do hope that as he matures as a candidate, and certainly as an elected official if he wins, he'll understand that uh, you need to be more inclusive, uh, recognize um, recognize all the different things that make our country great and uh, it, it is you know to see the negativity and the criticism and the insults is it, it, you know it's, it's hard uh, as, as a Republican but I've always uh, supported the Republican ticket and you know what uh, if I had any doubts about uh, whether I'm going to vote for a Republican or whether I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton uh, I when I went to see 13 hours the movie about Benghazi they were erased. Thank you very much. Uh, I too will support the Republican nominee, whoever that may be. I'm, I'm by no means a fan of Donald Trump. Uh, I think that uh, he's in large part an embarrassment and not representative of uh, myself or my party. Uh, but I do think that it will be interesting to see how many Democrats uh, publicly support and jump on board um, a potential U.S. Senate uh, nominee who's equally as erratic as Donald Trump and uh, Alan Grayson if he so uh, wins by the Democrat. I'm going to open up that question to the other Republicans on the, on the panel. Representative, Representative Ahern, if uh, Donald Trump is the uh, presidential nominee, yes or no, would you be supporting him? Yes, I will. You've endorsed uh, Donald Trump, correct? I have, okay, yes. Thank you. Senator Brandis? I'm sure I'll support the nominee. And Representative Peters? 
Adam Smith, I heard you turned it up last time. You don't have a good targeting question for today? Yeah. No, take care of it. All right, next question. This is for us. <laughs> 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 I just, I just want the record to be perfectly clear that I will not support the Republican nomination. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, it, it, I read the article about Susan Sarandon yesterday, and she said if it wasn't Bernie, she was voting for Trump. Yeah. Ma'am. Judy, uh, this question is for Senator Bandis and Representative Bruce Tong. Um, what, if anything, can the state do? With regard to the changes coming in the cruising and shipping industry due to the limitations of the Sunshine and Skyway Bridge, and in particular, what can you do to protect the Pinellas Point and Bayway areas of South uh, Pinellas County from being negatively impacted by those changes? Senator Brandis. So I don't think you're going to see anything, any substantial changes to to uh, to the bridge or to the port itself. Uh, as it relates to the size, the size limits, mostly the, the size is for the cruise ships. That's that's the problem. We're just going to have smaller cruise ships here, uh, probably a little bit older cruise ships. We won't get the brand new large, large mega ships. Um, but there's no reason to spend billions of dollars on the outsides of the port right now to for the cruise industry. There's just no there's no overriding need for that. Um, there's plenty of other ports that will take the larger cruise ships. And Representative. Uh, thank you. That's a very good uh, question. I join the comments of Senator Brandis, but let me say also of the seven state representatives that represent portions of Pinellas County, I'm the only one that has three additional counties because of the Skyway Bridge. And I've visited Port Manatee. I've heard all the theories of a drawbridge, uh, building uh, a cruise port terminal at Fort DeSoto. Uh, these have floated for a while and I'm just not sure what the answer is, but we need to do something. It might be put the emphasis on the cruise industry itself. Next question. I think she, Connie Cohn, your hand was up first, and then I'll go there. Yes, Connie Cohn. Um, recently, we've seen reports that many independents have uh, changed to the Republican Party in order to vote for moderate candidates. Do you? perceive that in a, a general election that those um, uh, people who have converted for that reason would vote for a Tea Party or religious right candidate. Who's your question for? This is Tom me. And who's your question for? Which legislature? Whoever would be willing to respond to it. Let's go, Representative, let's go, Representative Ahern. I just think that's the beauty of being an independent, that uh, anytime we politically try to analyze them, it, it doesn't work, so it, uh, it, they're all over the board typically, so it, it's a, for me anyway, my, my past experience with it, it's been anyone's guess. Honestly, I think Trump is his own brand. I don't think people see him as a traditional establishment Republican. And so I think it's just fascinating to have this kind of independent brand out there uh, that's kind of transcends the, the party brand. It's, it's something I don't think we've seen. Representative Dudley, let's get the counter on that. Really, the research shows that uh, independents vote in line with one of the parties uh, most of the time, higher than 80% of the time. I think that's what the research shows. So, you know, you can switch if you you know, if you're an NPA and you're uh, switching to be a Republican, that's the way we're going more than likely to begin with. So. Sir, up front, you had a question? Um, Senator Lapp, of course. Thank you. Uh, one observation, when you talked about moderates, when you talked about Trump, one observation I forgot to make uh, earlier, and that is that as I see Donald Trump and, and him getting away with uh, you know, swearing and some of the what he says and insulting people and so forth, I do see a bright side. That means there is a future for guys like me. <laughs> uh, Eric Gerard makes me want to talk like Donald Trump. Uh, 
Governor Scott just signed into law this week on new abortion restrictions. My question is for Representative Ahern and Representative Dudley. Can you cite any cases in recent history of a legal of a recipient of a legal uh, abortion having to be admitted to a local hospital? I think it's fairly well known that the regulation that was passed was really not to help women, but to uh, try to restrict a woman's right to choose. That's what it's all about. Uh, everything that I've heard about it, read about it, uh, and uh, heard in debates as well. So uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, it's ideology, and it definitely takes away from women uh, what their constitution says they have, which is the right to choose under the U.S. Constitution and the Florida Constitution, their privacy rights. Representative Ahern? There's, at least the way I read the bill, there's nothing in the bill that prohibits uh, a woman's right to choose uh, either way. All it says is that a doctor must have privileges at a hospital within a certain distance uh, in order to perform these types of surgical procedures. So, uh, in, in essence, it's protecting uh, her in case something does go wrong, and, and, and it does. From time to time, there'll be, there are cases that uh, um, a woman is rushed to the emergency room and the doctor there has, that, that performed that surgery has no admitting privileges, and this corrects that. Okay, we've got time for two more questions. One of the young tigers, please. Okay. Right, my question is for Representative Dudley. Oh, hey, hey. sorry. Hi, my name's Emma, and my question is for Representative Dudley and for Senator Lapa. Um, when discussing and voting on bills, do you always vote um, with party lines? And if not, then what are the issues that you are ten that you tend to be more flexible? Thank you very much for the question. That's a great question. I try to vote in concert with my beliefs, how I feel, what the you know policies are. I'm for uh, good policy, the greater good. I try not to vote just along party lines. I, I think that's uh, what most people are upset with uh, politicians for across the board. That we want good solutions. We want uh, help and for the common good, that we want to do the best thing, the smartest thing, the wisest thing. And, uh, you know, if you look at all the bills that are in the legislature that we pass, uh, I would say uh, probably vote with the other side uh, the vast majority of the time. Uh, there are some issues that are, I think, really crucial and important that uh, uh, we differ on. And uh, that's what's, you know, a lot of, is made of that. But uh, try to try to support uh, wise policy. Things are going to be useful for the people. Senator Lapa. Well, I, um, I now I, you know I, I I believe my job is to vote the way uh, the way I know best and the way my constituents want me to vote. And for the most part, my constituents are not ideologues. They're people who want successful governments, they want uh, successful schools, they want mental health system, they want uh, you know prisons that are secure, they want essential services. So there are times from time to time I vote uh, different than the, the quote leadership in my party, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, the treatment of public employees, uh, perhaps when it comes to, for instance, my, uh, my bill to give the children of uh, to give all children in-state tuition if they graduate from uh, Florida High School. So, you know, I, I, there have been some times that I've deviated. Representative Peters, you want to jump in for 30 seconds? I, I did want to jump in, and a lot of people think that we're all polarized, um, and we hear that talk in the media, especially because of Washington. And the one thing that impressed me after getting into the House of Representatives for the last four years is how many bills pass that are unanimous with very little or no con debate. And last year, I haven't done the count this year, but last year we passed 232 bills and more than 200 of them passed, at least in the House of Representatives, which is 120 people, unanimous or nearly unanimous with little or no con debate. 
And so what we don't let people know is how well we do work together, and we are not as polarized as most people think. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Peters. Okay, last question. Please. <coughs> Betty Morgan speaking. This is for the two black fellas up there. Based particularly, Senator, on what you just said and your beliefs and so forth, based on the fact that the governor a few times has been turned away from some of the things he wanted to get through, would you think of him as a good U.S. Senator? Senator Lavelle. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not exactly sure I understand the connection of the question of based on the times he's been turned away. Um, you know, I like Rick Scott as an individual. I think he has the best interests of the state at heart. Uh, I have not agreed with him uh, on, on every issue, uh, starting when he was elected and throughout the six years we've served together. But he works very hard. And what I admire is his single-minded focus, focus on great jobs. And the guy thinks about jobs when he wakes up in the morning, all the way until he goes to bed at night, and I think that's uh, showed the results, and, and that I support. Representative Blackwell? <clears throat> I, uh, too, support the governor, by and large. Uh, and as to your question about the U.S. Senate, uh, my only comments would be that I hope he stays focused on the current job that he has, because uh, there is a lot of work left to do in Florida uh, before, um, you know, and, and on, he may not even run for U.S. Senate, I'm not sure. He's never told me that he was going to do that. Uh, but I, I just hope that he uh, focuses on uh, being the chief executive of uh, Florida, first and foremost. Okay, we're going to do rapid fire here for five minutes, starting with Representative Ahern. And the first question, and this is everyone is going to answer, keep your answers quick, let's get through it. Who will be the next governor of Florida? Adam Button. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully, Bob Buckhorn or uh, Dwight Graham. You run it then? A button. Senator? You know, uh, two years before the last election, no one had ever heard of Rick Scott. I think we're in a day when, when we have outsiders like Rick Scott get elected, and so I think it's too early to predict. I concur. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have a problem predicting that the next governor will be a Democrat. <laughs> And I declined to run this time. <laughs> Who will be the next president of the United States? And you have to name a person. So get out with that last name. Hillary Clinton. I'm afraid it may be Donald Trump. <laughs> I think it's going to be a uh, deadlock convention and uh, Jeb Bush will be the next president. <laughs> Uh, Ted Cruz. Hillary Clinton. I think it'll be a deadlock convention and Paul Ryan will be the next president. Donald Trump. Okay, last question. What is the hot issue that will dominate the 2017 legislative session? I want a, I want a food fight answer here. I don't want budget or something. That, I want a nice... Uber versus taxi cab kind of answer. I'll say the, uh, uh, with uh, the projected incoming speaker is Richard Corcoran, I'll say the status quo is in uh, deep jeopardy with, with regard to uh, lobbyists controlling a lot of the, uh, uh, the conversation. The issue I'll focus on for the next two years is our prison system. It's in crisis. It needs to be some leadership to take it on. And so uh, one of the we're going to work on it over the next two years. I'm excited about it. It's probably the biggest challenge we've ever taken on the legislative process. Water and fracking. Water and criminal justice reform. Senator Lavinoff. Your voice is single, uh, single issue probably will be the Uber versus taxi cab issue or the. Uh, 
I know the prison is the most uh, very, very important and mental health will continue with, but I think as far as controversial where there will be fighting, um, and it's been for a long time, it's still going to be the cost of Medicare. How do we get Medicare more affordable? And so the ambulatory centers, um, we finally got scope of practice done. We're the 50th state to finally do scope of practice. We're way too late on that. I think you'll see a lot more changes on, on coordinated care and, and different types of ways to give people access to medical care. Yeah, I think health care will also, the one issue that always comes up for the last several years and then goes away will be gaming. Thank you very much. Let's give everyone up here a round of applause. the winner of the Tiger uh, Fang Ball Award, and it's our young tiger, Emma. Yeah.